Good evening, everyone. My name is Ingrid Anderson, and I'm the Associate Director of Jewish Studies here at Boston University. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Rebecca Claren, our speaker this afternoon. So she's been writing about the American West for more than 20 years. Her journalism, for which she has won the Hillman Prize, an Alicia Patterson Foundation Fellowship, and 10 grants from the Fund for Investigative Journalism, has appeared in such publications as Mother Jones, High Country News, The Nation, and Indian Country Today. Her debut novel, Kickdown, Skyhorse Press, 2018, was shortlisted for the Penn Bellwether Prize. And the cost of free land was named best book of 2023 by Kirkus Reviews, the Jewish Forward, and the Tribal College Journal. It's also the winner of a uh, 2021 Whiting Nonfiction Grant. The cost of free land, said the jury, is, quote, a brilliantly conceived family history one that places questions of responsibility and atonement at the center of the conversation about America's political future. For me, her work raises so many compelling questions. How did the marginalized and persecuted status of the Jews moving to the Lakota lands affect their relationship with the Lakota? Are there similar similarities in the trauma of displacement? And finally, how is empathy created? Is it through similar experiences or some other pathway? Um, there will be time for questions after the talk, so please join me in welcoming Rebecca Claren. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, it's so nice to see you. If any of you out there in the outskirts want to move over, less on the frontier, more with us, you're welcome to. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I live in Portland, Oregon most of the time, and it's wonderful to be. I went to Smith College, so I used to spend time on the East Coast, but it's been a long time. So thank you so much for having me. This book, The Cost of Free Land, which I consider a real entangled history of my Jewish homesteading ancestors on the South Dakota prairie and their Lakota neighbors, it really started with three questions. What are the stories we tell in families and in nations? What are the stories we don't tell? And why don't we tell those stories? Because of course, the myth that we create and tell to our children and their children, it's created by both what we tell and what we don't tell, right? I grew up hearing really amazing stories of my ancestors on that South Dakota prairie, stories that I loved, things like, uh, about my Uncle Louie, who could stand on the back of a horse. Or another about a cousin of mine who every morning, this is the family lore, he would have to clear a path of rattlesnakes between the house and the outhouse when he was five years old. <laughs> who knows if that's really true, but that's the story. Um, and then the one that I think of as like our greatest hit, that weirdly, at least three women in my family individually described as a quote unquote cute story, is the story of my great-great-grandmother, Faga Etka, who in the winter in South Dakota, so it could be as cold as like negative 40, she would send her daughters, one of whom was my great-grandmother, who I'm named after, outside armed with an ax or a stick to crack the, cre the ice of the creek that ran near their home. She would then strip naked and dunk herself in this water. This was her mikvah which for those of you who don't know, is a ritual bath that many religious Jewish women take to mark the end of their menstrual cycle. And yet for all of the stories that I was told, there were never any stories about my ancestors' Lakota neighbors. The closest Lakota reservation was only 13 miles from the northern end of what became my family's ranch. This book is not meant to be a definitive history of Jewish Americans, Jewish homesteaders, immigrants, or a definitive history of Native Americans or the Lakota. It is meant to be somewhat of an, of, because let me just say, when we tell those histories in the way I learned them growing up in silos, I really feel like you miss the depth of the injustice. You miss the depth of how the United States very clearly created policies to benefit certain, certain and 
and to harm others. So this is really instead a history that looks at the way these, these, different, these different histories really push and pull on one another. As you've mentioned, I've been writing about the American West for, it's been 23 years at this point. And in a way, the through line of all of my work has been how do you take seemingly boring policies and laws and show how they play out in the lives of real people, in the lives of real families. And yet when it came to my own family history, I maintained a blind spot for a very long time. I missed the connections. Um, that I'm that this book is meant to sort of correct and and to show really how far I had to come I'd like to op to read to you a little bit from the very very beginning of the book uh, from a reporting trip I took 23 years ago um, to the Pine Ridge Reservation I am a person who likes to know what's going to happen so if you're like me I'm going to read a little I'm going to talk a little I have slides to share that are photos from that well, they're from the book, but there are a lot of them are from my family's collection and also a Lakota family who I write about in the book, their collection too. And then there'll be time for questions. So thank you so much for being here today. 22 years ago, 23 now, while on a reporting trip to the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, I found myself sitting shotgun in a truck with a man who would later become president of the Oglala Sioux tribe. He was smoking weed. When he offered me some, I declined, hoping to indicate a level of professionalism that, as a reporter visiting an indigenous community for the first time, I certainly couldn't claim. We had driven off of a dirt road and were parked at the top of a rise. Before us were green rolling hills and the flat plains beyond. It was gray outside. A herd of buffalo with their dark brown backs dotted the landscape. It is likely that I was wearing jeans and a plain gray t-shirt. Back then, this was more or less my uniform for reporting trips, as I believed that by wearing clothes with limited personality, I could signal to sources that my identity didn't matter. In my bag beside me were a camera, a DAT recorder, and my slim reporter's notebook with the binding at the top. I had one great question prepared, which I had learned from a This American Life comic book about how to be a reporter. <laughs> My boss had told me to write down every single thing that I saw and heard and smelled, but I failed to record whether the man beside me in the truck smoked a pipe or rolled a joint, if he seemed very high, or how I felt about any of it. Sitting there in the small cab, I was uncomfortable with the quiet, I had yet to learn how to follow a source's lead. I had yet to learn so many things. In my nervousness, I decided to share something about myself. I told him that my family used to own land in South Dakota, that we'd had a ranch somewhere called Jew Flats. I told him I had an uncle everyone called Bronco Lou. I remember thinking this might make him see we had something in common, that this might endear me to him. He was polite maybe stoned. He nodded. His smile was thin in a way I couldn't read. It would take me years to realize what my words would immediately mean to any Lakota citizen. The 9-11 attacks had taken, oh, I think we lost the, oh, there it is. The 9-11 attacks had taken place the week before I visited Pine Ridge. One evening while I was there, over a paper plate of food that was shared with me at a family gathering, I said something about the horror of the recent events in New York. Sitting beside me, a former American Indian movement activist stared at me, her mouth a flat line. She said, now you know what it feels like to be attacked and invaded. It's about time for Americans to understand how that feels. The day before, an Oglala elder had told me, when I saw those people running through the streets with terror, I was reminded of my ancestors running in fear at Wounded Knee. Even then, I failed to connect certain dots, certain historic realities between her, the Lakota, and myself. All these years later, what stays with me from that reporting trip, what seems now to be the clear central narrative, appeared at the time to be only tangential to the article I was there to write. <laughs> 
I think because of my training as a journalist instead of as a historian, it was important to me to, to not write a book that was only living in the past, but that showed the legacy of the past today. So the book toggles back and forth between what happened a long time ago and how it has played out in today's world. And it has characters that are real people, of course, my great aunt Etta and a Lakota elder, Doug Whitebull, who help us understand the legacy of what happened before to today. I think growing up, I believed that history was something that we are always walking away from, that it's something that lives behind us. But after all the research I've done into both Jewish history and American history and Lakota history, all of my conversations with indigenous elders and Jewish rabbis and leaders, I now think of history in a totally different way. I really think of it now like it's like thread through a seam, the thread of history through the seam of this contemporary moment. And because of that, and also because of my interest in showing the way that government action plays out in the ripples of individual families, I start this book not in South Dakota. Chapter one isn't there. It starts in Russia, in Odessa, which was part of Russia at the time, um, where my family was living in the late 1800s. To understand how a Jewish community ended up settling on Lakota land, we must begin in Odessa in the spring of 1881 when my great-great-grandfather, Harry Sinekin, was around 19 years old. It was unseasonably hot. In fields outside the city, crops were wilting. An economic downturn had left thousands of factory workers unemployed. People were hungry. A dry wind blew incessantly, raising dust and dirt that fell from the sky like ash. Months earlier, terrorists had assassinated the Russian Tsar Alexander II. Rumors boiled in the streets and the countryside blaming Jews. Though unfounded, the accusations flourished. Jews had long been reviled as different, as Christ killers. In early May, as out-of-work men spilled from taverns, they formed a mob and stormed the street looking for Jews. Some later reported hearing the chants from blocks away, the Jews drink our blood. Harry Sinekin, drawing on the survival instincts that would serve him well on the South Dakota prairie two decades later, dove under his bed as soon as he heard the angry rioters. If he was armed at all, it was at best with a kitchen knife as it was illegal for Jews to own guns. Others would later recall having only rocks and slabs of wood with which to defend themselves. Harry heard men yelling. He heard the windows shattering. He heard the door crash to the ground. The mob smashed every mirror in the house. They broke all the furniture. And then Harry felt the heavy wooden bed frame crash onto his face. His nose broke. Blood was everywhere. The peasants or the soldiers, whoever they were, they found him. They beat him. They broke every one of his ribs, set fire to the house, and left him for dead. The looting of Jewish shops and homes and the attacks on Jewish people continued in Odessa for six days. Such violence towards Jews was so common, so systemic in Eastern Europe, that it had a name, pogrom, which comes from a Russian word that means both to destroy and to conquer. Somehow, Harry survived and escaped the burning house. For the rest of his life, he would suffer from the effects of the beating and smoke inhalation. Even so, he was lucky to be alive. This is an immigrant story, like all immigrant stories of survival, of leaving the known world to flee to a new place it begins with fear and relies on luck. My family's stories about Harry have always followed a classic script. We highlight his pluck and how he overcame adversity on the road to opportunity. We fail to acknowledge the reverberations of our family's good fortune or the fact that it came at the expense of others. So Harry leaves Odessa we never know what happened to his father or his uncle. I presume they died. 
Um, and he goes back to his mother's shtetl, this village in what is today a little area near Minsk in what is today Belarus. And um, he comes to Kapulia and eventually within short order he recovers from his beatings, although for the rest of his life we all think that he probably had a traumatic brain injury. He was very, very erratic in his behavior. Um, but he comes back and he gets married to Fegatka of the mikvah bath fame, and they, they have six children. Here is a photograph of their shtetl and their home in Kapulia. You can see there's Yiddish writing at the top. This was probably a postcard. Just so you know, my family throws nothing away. Like I have nightgowns that are 100 years old, tax returns from 1911. My great grandmother, there were 30 day diaries of hers that had been kept. In my Aunt Etta's house where other people keep like food or coats, she has boxes of old letters and photographs. So I was so fortunate to work on this book project and have this incredible treasure trove of family documents, many of which were written in Yiddish, and I luckily got a grant that helped me to translate those letters. So this says in Yiddish, the Hinterish house, and we think this was like the back house. The people in this photograph are my great-grandmother's older siblings. That's her sister Fanny and her older brother Ted. And we think this was taken probably uh, turn of the 1900s, around then, because by that point, um, or early, maybe 19, yeah, no, 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 late, late 1880s, 1890s. Life in Kapulia was hard for Jews. Jews were not allowed to own land like Jews throughout the Pale of Settlement. They didn't call it a reservation. They called it the Pale of Settlement. These were communities where Jews were forced to live and mostly they couldn't, they could live sometimes in Odessa. We think Harry was able to live there because his father was a tinsmith and he was trained as a tinsmith. And so he had this important artisanal skill. Um, but mostly Jews were living in shtetls. They weren't allowed to own land. Uh, there's constant fear of being conscripted into the Russian army. This happens in family lore as this happened to Fega Etka's brother when he was very young. Jews were often forced to convert to the Russian Orthodox Church. And the story is that Jews were always put in the front in the war. So they would be the first, sort of as cannon fodder, the first to die. And there weren't barracks. Soldiers would regularly come through those sh these shtetls, and there were no places for the soldiers to live. And they would live regularly in the houses of the Jews. And my Aunt Etta interviewed some cousins of hers in the 70s who grew up, who lived in these shtetls. And they said, we were, we were always afraid of, that we would be raped by the soldiers. So in, after these pogroms begin, in the, like the 1881 pogrom that Harry was in, many Jews from Eastern Europe are coming to America. America doesn't restrict, dis, um, restrict immigration until 1924. And between the 1880s and the early 1920s, as, as many of you may have known, there's the, it's, the estimates are very wide, but you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions and millions of Jews are coming to America, and my family is part of this migration. And Harry, we think this postcard is sent to Harry when he is living in America because he follows his brother to Sioux City, Iowa. The trail line leaves New York and you take it all the way to Sioux City where there's already so many Jews from Kapulia living there. There's a synagogue called the Ancha Kapulia Synagogue. Yeah. And um, my uncles and my great grandfather, they are peddlers, which was a pretty classic job for Jews. And they had a backpack on their back and they would, or they were in wagons and they would travel around sort of as the store for farmers in the area. At some point, Harry probably saw a sign like this, but not exactly like this. So this sign, for those of you who can't see, says Indian land for sale. But Harry would have seen a sign that said, there it's gone again, okay, it's back. Um, free land, he would have seen a broadside, maybe in a railroad station, maybe in the newspaper. The United States was interested in settling the plains, recently belonging to native people, with settlers, white enough settlers. You know, my family, the dividing line in Europe 
always was, are you Jewish or are you not Jewish? And you come, they come to America and they've sort of, with their white enough skin, they're, and we know that, that class in America is judged on a curve and whiteness helps, right? And so they have more class and they, even as immigrants, um, they are allowed to get in on this free land. And this was 160 acres under the Homestead Act. This was 160 acres that was theirs to keep if they could do what was called proving up. So they had three to five years, depending on what exact year it was, to tame the wild prairie. Taming the wild prairie meant turning it into quote unquote productive. Now we know that that wild prairie is like the best bet we have of fighting climate change because all those wild grasses sink carbon. But at the time, it looked to the United States government like it was doing nothing. And so they wanted settlers to be put on the, to come to the land and farm it or ranch it to make money off the land. And my family jumps at this chance. They were not allowed to own land in Europe. And here they could have land just by moving their bodies there. They also had in order to quote unquote prove up and make this become, have the land be turned into their own private property, they had to build a structure on the land. This is the glamorous structure in which they lived. This is, these were classic, this, they are 10 by 12. The man in those amazing boots, second in from the right, that's my great grandmother, great grandfather, Jake Cosberg. All three of Harry and Fega Etka's daughters, they had six children, three boys and three girls, all of them homesteaded. All three girls married Jew Flats homesteaders. So just to step back, my family doesn't go there alone. About 70-ish Jews from Sioux City all go together. If any of you, raise your hand if you've ever been to Wall Drug. Any of you know that place? Okay, so this place, Jew Flats, was about 25 miles north of, G of wall drug, what is today? This, if for those of you who don't know, it's a it's a drugstore in the middle of nowhere. But there's these signs that say free water, <laughs> and for like miles away, and it's become kind of a famous tourist trap for the region. Um, for my family, Jew Flats and the land there was, as my great grandmother and her sister Rose called it, the good earth. This place made them feel American. It allowed them to shake off their suspect immigrant status and belong. Um, here they are. <laughs> I don't know how they kept those clothes so clean and white. That's my great great grandmother, Fega Etka, on the far right. And next to her is my Aunt Fanny and an assortment of grandchildren and children. You can see that dirt structure in the back. That's a sod. It was probably their house, what they lived in, before they had a chance to build that, that claim shack. They lived in a house built from dirt. And um, you can only imagine how nice those would be. <laughs> um, but they are, this I think at this point had become a barn. My family realizes very quickly what the Lakota had known for centuries, which was it was very difficult to farm far away from the riverbanks. And so their, their crops, they complete, I had National Archives records of theirs that I found, and, and the first three years in a row of their time on the prairie, they lose their entire crop of oats and corn. And so they go in for cattle, and they have a cattle ranch, and by the, the 1950s, my family has an almost 6,000 acre cattle ranch on Jew Flats. Um, the freedoms that were afforded to them there, this was a really hard life, as you can imagine, and yet they felt so free. Here is a photo of, the school, of their school picture. If you can see Ruth S. written above one of those pictures, that's my great-grandmother. And Louis, the guy who could later stand on a horse, he's over on the right, it says Louis on the side. Uh, here they are, this is school. You notice it's boys and girls together, Jews, non-Jews alike. This was not the kind of opportunity that they had in Kapulia. But the land was meant more to them than just having the psychological benefit. Uh, I, because of my training as an investigative reporter, I wanted to take all of these stories that I had been told and kind of layer them over something resembling a fact. And so I pulled every single deed 
on my family's land in South Dakota, and then I pulled every mortgage that my family took out on that land during the time that they owned it. My grandmother and her sister sold the last bit of Jew Flats in 1970, which is before I was born. And you can see, I made some Excel spreadsheets, I did, had, did math, people checked my math. You can see, based on the dates of those mortgages, when I compared them to all the letters and information I had about my family's history, there's this pattern. They would take out a mortgage, and then they would start a new business that wasn't reliant on weather. For my family, that meant they started a lot of saloons in the Black Hills of South Dakota, which was about 70 miles away from Jew Flats. Um, they also would use, they would take out a mortgage, and they would buy more land. Or they would take out a mortgage, and they would move. They moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. They kept their land. It was like kind of an ATM for them on some level. And this, of course, is just a very American capitalist way of doing things. Um, I found, when adjusted for inflation in today's dollars, the amount of money my family take out in mortgages during that time, 1908 to 1970, it's $1.1 $1 .1 million. It was 100% the underpinnings of so much of my family's wealth. It did not mean they didn't have to work hard and take risks and do all of that, but how far could they have gone in this country without that kind of capital? I think it's important to mention that 25% of all American adults living today are descendants from homesteaders who would have had the same access to capital. The vast majority of them are white. It's something like 92 million adults living in America today. It's a lot of us. It's a lot of people. And for all the benefits that my family received on the South Dakota Prairie, they were coming at some cost to their Lakota neighbors. Does anyone know what this is a photograph of? Buffalo! That's right. Those are buffalo skulls. And you can see that they're almost two stories high. Um, this was taken in the 1890s. Only 30 or 40 years earlier, 20 years earlier, the entire Great Plains had been blanketed with buffalo. And yet in 1851, well, in 1851, let me start. In 1851, the United States signs a treaty with the Lakota Nation and other Great Plains Nation, reserving, here's a map, I know it's a little hard to see, this is in the front of my book, but you can see the, the widest line in that, that's the amount of land that is reserved in perpetuity to be the Lakotas. And I use the word reserved really intentionally. It was very important to me as a non-indigenous person to do this book with as much cultural sensitivity as possible. And I can, if anyone has a question, I can get into more details about how I did some things differently. But one of the things I did was I, I hired several Lakota elders and sources of mine to read this book before my editor even saw it, my editor at Penguin Books. And one of them said, we didn't own it. It wasn't for our ownership. We don't believe you can own land. We live with the land, not on the land. We reserved it for our use. That was the language that we used in that treaty. So I used that word intentionally. So in 1851, they, they have all of this land that is going to be theirs to hunt buffalo on forever. But around the exact same time, California becomes a state. And the railroad companies, which at the time were one of the most power, if not the most powerful corporation in America, and then like today, corporations had a lot of political power, the railroad wanted to connect California with the rest of the nation. And they wanted to put a railroad line across the Great Plains. Inconveniently, all of this land has just been set aside for native use. And also inconveniently are the millions of buffalo in the way of that railroad line. So promises made become promises broken. And by official policy, the United States tells its soldiers to shoot every buffalo they can. Every buffalo dead is an Indian gone, one general said. And um, Buffalo, if anyone's ever heard of the Buffalo Bill Show, he, he bragged about how many <laughs> buffalo he killed, but he wasn't alone. And so that by the 1890s, 
there are a couple hundred buffalo left. That's all the buffalo that are left on the Great Plains and in North America, down from what had originally been some way, I mean, I know it's a massive estimate, but something between 30 and 60 million buffalo when Columbus arrived in this, in this country. Um, and as you can see from this map, um, the, I don't know why this keeps happening. Is there something I'm doing with the, the mic? Back away, okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, and the United States then continues to, to edit, let's call it, that treaty over and over again. They, they straight up, I use the word stolen land really intentionally because sometimes it's very blatant stealing of land and sometimes it's actually somewhat legal, but you could argue, of course, that it was also stolen. But when I say stolen, that really means something specific to me, such as the United States Supreme Court in 1980 ruling that one of these land takings was 100% land theft. And so that by the time my family is planting crops in 1908, based on my calculations, the Lakota are living on just 2% of the land that had been reserved for them to have in perpetuity forever. And of course, the United States doesn't just dispossess native people of their land. In an effort to make it easier to take native land, the United States sets out to to fracture native relationship with land. And by, in, an, in a way to do that, makes Lakota religion and culture illegal. So that Lakota cannot, here my family has just come to this country. At no point do they have to braid their last hala or change their name or stop speaking and writing Yiddish to become citizens of the United States. But that is exactly what is being asked of the Lakota. And as I'm sure all of you know, many Lakota, all Lakota children by official policy and all native children are sent to boarding schools. Um, these are for the most part, some Lakota, some native elders I've met talk about having a good experience, but the vast majority had a really a horrible time. These places were rife with physical and sexual abuse and they were places of forced assimilation. What we now call um, cultural genocide, where Lakota, it was very intentional that kids were sent more than a day's, day's ride from their families so that they could not see their families. Children were sent away as young as four and five years old. It's so, I still get upset thinking about it and they wouldn't see their families for nine months. I have given, I have been giving lectures since my book came out October 3rd and I still get like 30 of them, I think. Um, I'm still upset about it. Obviously, there's no reason not to be upset. Whew, just surprised. Um, so, the thing is that, before I go to that slide, I wanna say is that I thought a lot about this history and, and I was a kid who grew up totally obsessed with the Holocaust. I was that kid who would like stand and do dramatic readings on the mantle in my living room of the Anne Frank diary. And yet I didn't know until Doug Whitebull, a Lakota elder told me that Hitler was inspired by this treatment of native people. I see so many of you shaking your heads, of course, we're at an esteemed university, you all know that, but I didn't know that and I wish I had. Um, reservations became the inspiration for concentration camps. The way that people were starved into submission in ghettos and it, those concentration camps was inspired by America's intention of not giving enough food as had been promised in treaties um, to sort of diminish Lakota and other nations capacities to fight back. The list goes on and on. Eugenics, there's so many examples. And, and what does it mean that my family survived and escaped oppression only to come to this country and become part of a system of oppression to other people? What did they know? There's no mention in any of the letters that my family had or journals or diaries about their native neighbors. 
And I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. What did they know? Were they thinking about it? And an indigenous elder who I write about in the book who has become really a mentor to me, her name is Judge Abby Abenanti, and she's Chief Justice of the Yurok Nation in Northern California. And she was also a chief, well, a superior court justice in the state of California. Her, the way she runs her courtroom has become really a model for a lot of judges throughout this country. And she said to me, everyone knew what was happening to Indians. And then she said, and this is very her, she said, but when you're running for your life in terror, which is what your family was doing when they came here, you're not stopping to have a quick restorative justice conversation along the way. She said, it's gonna take several generations of not living in what we today call trauma, because even being the children at times of, of immigrants can be a really challenging dynamic and situation, you know, and she said it, it makes sense that it's come to you, to your generation, to step towards this history. Even though we didn't have stories about my family and the Lakota, we had these mysterious photographs. Here's my Uncle Louie standing in the Black Hills at Lake Sylvan between two men dressed in what has been identified for me as Dakota uh, beadwork regalia. Here's another one. This is my Uncle Jack Sinekin, and he's shaking hands with a person who I really didn't know who this was. But on my first trip to the Dakotas, when I started working on this book five years ago, um, tribal historians there said, we think this is Joseph Whitebull. Joseph Whitebull was a really famous person. He was the nephew of Sitting Bull, and there was a whole book written about him called Warpath in the 30s. And because I had been reporting, before this was a book project, I had been hired by the nation, and well, an investigative nonprofit, to write a series of stories that ran in the nation in Indian country today about native nations and native individuals. And um, I'm glad I did that, because I don't think I could have written this book without those years that I spent writing that series. And, be, and it, it meant that people trust, enough people trusted me as a journalist to open some really important doors for me in Lakota country, including a source of mine who said, oh, I know the White Bull family. I used to be married into that family. And he introduced me to this man. This is Doug White Bull, who is an elder who, the, the first day I met him at Elder Housing on Standing Rock, he said, I am the oldest living descendant of the man in that photograph. And knowing Doug has really changed the way I think about America and my own history. Here is a photograph of him and his sister Rita when they were children living on the banks of the Missouri River on the Standing Rock Reservation. And remember I said earlier that by the time my family planted their first crops in 1908, the Lakota were living on about 2% of what had been reserved for them. But the United States does not stop in 1908 trying to take Lakota land. In fact, you can argue that effort is ongoing. And in the 50s, the United States decides to put a series of federal dams on the Missouri River. This was done for flood control, but when they put the dams in place, they actually flooded communities, and the, mass, the vast majority of communities that were impacted were native communities. Hundreds and hundreds of Lakota people had to move, and they had to move away from land that was on the banks of the Missouri, that was forested, huge, ancient cottonwood trees, um, good hunting, and, and move inland to a place that one elder said in a congressional hearing, he said, it's so dry, this land we have to go to, even the jackrabbit brings a lunchbox out here. <laughs> and, um, and so Doug and I, one day though, while I was working on this book, we went out and we visited what was left of this area where his family had, it wasn't his land anymore, but we went and visited. And I'm gonna read just one last place from the book and then we'll go to questions. Thank you for listening. One day, Doug, myself, and one of Doug's former students, Jeff McLaughlin, drive out to visit what's left of the place where Doug grew up on the edge of the Missouri River. There aren't any roads to get there. Up and down over buttes, we off-road in an old minivan that Jeff calls his buck. It's a truck and a van, get it? He asks me with a quick, shy smile. Jeff, like many former students, calls Doug Lake She, Lakota for uncle, 
As we near the cut bank, far above the deep blue water, red choke cherries and wild plum cluster in the folds and creases of the land. When we reach the grassy slope where Doug used to run barefoot with his sisters, I ask him how it feels. Feels great, feels like home, he says, closing his eyes under the bright sun. Swallows swoop through the sky. The air is filled with birdsong and the buzz of insects and the river and the wind. But for the moment, I'm not noticing any of that. I'm distracted by our effort to touch the past. An old cemetery, fenced off and thick with choke cherry, has survived the flood. While it had been slated for removal, the water never got that high, and the feds, by neglect or delay, left it alone. Deep inside the thicket of wild plants are gravestones of Doug's relatives, and he is determined to visit. Getting there will require this blind old man who relies on his cane as if it were a third limb to do the equivalent of bushwhacking. I explain to Doug where to put his foot and how to hold on to my arm and Jeff's arm. I'm embarrassed to share this part, but it's what happened. On the audio file, you can hear my voice asking if this is a good idea, cautioning Doug to be careful. Jeff quietly helps Doug step over the wire fence, gets a camp chair out of the van, and sets it up in the shade in case Doug needs a break. I should have known better. By this point, I knew a lot of Doug's stories, especially his greatest hits, such as the time he, as a teenager, ran a 50-mile race finishing with bloody feet. I knew about his time at, at boarding school, where he was repeatedly hit and kicked by his teachers, sometimes with a wooden board across his bottom for the crime of speaking Lakota or not making his bed correctly. I knew that he'd survived all that and become a straight A student anyway. Not a person given to giving up, Doug slowly but steadily traverses the weedy expanse from the van to the graves deep in the middle of the cemetery. He never slows down, never complains. Standing as close as we can get to the old stones, the words in the marble etched in Lakota, I read the inscription aloud to Doug and he translates. Here was Mary Whitebull, who died May 18, 1902, at the age of four. The shade of the choke cherry makes patches across our faces. As Doug takes a moment to contemplate the graves, I'm struck again by the weight of his loss, of what has been taken from him and his family to ensure a specific brand of American progress. There's a debate described in the Talmud, which is an ancient Jewish text, between two rabbis over what should be done if it's discovered that a house or even a palace was built using a stolen beam as part of its foundation. One rabbi says the entire building must be demolished so that the beam can be returned to its original owners. The other rabbi, the far more pragmatic, says the building can remain standing if the full value of the beam is repaid. Both rabbis make it clear that as soon as it is known that the beam was stolen, those living in the house must do something. They must make amends. Our country was built on a stolen beam, Rabbi Sharon Brous of Los Angeles famously said in a 2017 sermon. To ignore this history and the legacy of this history diminishes the legitimacy and the power of this house, of this nation. The money that has come to the Lakota was arguably never a fair trade for what was taken, rarely a deal negotiated without some degree of coercion and the losses compound one another. The flooding of Doug's childhood home here on the banks of the Missouri, built on the taking of his father's land and his grandfather's land and his father's before that. And what of everything else that was stolen? The years Doug spent in fear at boarding school, the state mandated destruction of Lakota language, religion, and culture? What payment can be made to replace such a loss? Thank you. Thank you. I meant to tell you earlier, so I'm just before we go to the Q&A, that Judge Abby did said something that really changed my life. She said, you know, if you're going to look at this history, you need to grapple with it. And what's more Jewish than grappling? And she said, you have to study your own culture 
for thinking about how to respond to it? What do the Jews say about how to respond to a harm, even one you didn't commit, but one you benefited from? And that led me to spend the next three years studying with my rabbi in Portland, Oregon, doing a, a process called Hevruta, which is a paired, it's an ancient process of paired study. And we read the Torah and the Talmud, these ancient Jewish texts, looking for learning and teachings about atonement and repentance and repair, and then also looking at the rabbis of today who are looking at those old teachings and interpreting them for how to respond to, in the words of one rabbi, Toba Spitzer, who is from out here in Massachusetts, calls uh, America's original twin sin sins, the enslaving of people and the taking of land. So with that, I am glad to answer your questions. If anyone has any. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about what has been taking the Torah to Paris and how people are asking them to repent? The anti Semitism that my relatives faced in South Dakota. Well, you know, I mean, they were, they were, on the one hand, they had so many opportunities that they didn't have in Russia but they were sort of islands surrounded by other, other settlers. And there was definitely friendliness, I think in, born in part because to get by, you really had to farm collectively, you had to rely on your neighbors. But again, there was, there was a systemic effort to restrict how well Jews could do. Something, I learned so many things while working on this book that blew my mind. One thing I didn't know is that prohibition the law that was passed to say we couldn't sell alcohol was done in part because Jews were widely um, overrepresented in the alcohol business in, in that, and like foreign born immigrants. Interestingly, in Russia, Jews were often put in charge of taverns. The, the Russian noblemen, because drinking wine on Shabbat is part of Jewish culture, there was a sense Jews can handle their liquor. They're gonna know, they're gonna be reliable. And so when they came to America, it was a business they knew. And like my great grandfather, that was one of his jobs in Russia. And so he started a saloon. And South Dakota was one of the very first states to um, pass prohibition before it was a national law. So for my relatives who were making good money in as saloon owners, and they had a liquor, one of them had a liquor distribution business in the Black Hills, they had lost the way they were making money and they moved to St. Paul. And there was so much anti-Semitism in Minneapolis. Um, the K, there were more KKK in Minneapolis that were like cops and people in positions of great power. Um, it was really not very safe. There was a lot of, of uh, persistent anti-Semitism. So I, I'm sure there are more specific examples in the book that I'm missing, um, but I, in this moment I'm having trouble remembering them. <laughs> but there were, it was sort of ongoing. And even when I was visiting, on the one hand, people were kind to me, um, the non-native people that I was visiting on what used to be Jew flats. And on the other hand, there was sort of like this diminishment talking about my Uncle Louie. I mean, maybe he really was a bad rancher, but there was also this sense, like people said like, oh, we just thought, he was with the mob because that the mob because he was Jewish. We just figured that was how he like stayed in business. You know, there's just sort of this casual um, throwaway. So, yeah. Yeah. What was it like talking about the history with your family? Like, did it kind of change your entire dynamic? It's such a good question. Yes, and in fact, there's a moment in the book where I describe this really hard moment where my great aunt Etta said don't write about this. And it wasn't anything having to do with our relationship with the Lakota. It was about the fact that I was writing about the bootlegging that my family ends up getting involved with in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I wrote about, there were so many family history stories and secrets I didn't tell in this book. But there were these, it was to me important that bootlegging was their, they couldn't get other jobs. There was one of their, their attorneys, um, he had gone, to, I think he went to Harvard and he comes back to Minneapolis and he can't get a job in any law firm. Um, so there were not a lot of good options for Jews and for my family, they embraced bootlegging. But one of my relatives went to prison. He went to Leavenworth. And 
Um, I really, it was really hard to figure out how to write about these family secrets. There's things like domestic violence that I describe, things I think are actually just very normal in a lot of families, but it is not the classic script that my family has always been so proud of the way we've done so many achieving things. I would say my generation, um, nothing but incredibly proud of this book and so many of my, and my parents and cousins. But for some of, for those, I think it's about like those of us who didn't know any of the people that I'm talking about, who only ever heard of them as these sort of like people who just look good in photos and were perfect, you know, and hardworking and very Jewish. And, um, and for the people who, their children who are still alive, it was more difficult. But I will say, and it's been a, one of the most powerful experiences of my reporting career in my life really, in that, despite concern and hardness around some of this, I just kept leaning into the conversation. I didn't, I tried really hard not to abandon any of these people I love so much in their hurt or discomfort. And I just kept showing up. Um, Mary Carr wrote a really wonderful book about how to write memoir about your family. And I followed her directions and she said, before the book is typeset, bring a copy in person. And I did that and I brought my very adorable younger son with me. And, um, and I brought it to them and I, and I sat, it was so <laughs> nerve wracking. We're at Shabbat and they're like, do a reading. And I find myself reading aloud about the people that I'm writing about in front of them. But um, this is all to say, it wasn't done easily, but it felt like the job. And it, um, and right before Yom Kippur, my Aunt Etta had gotten an early draft of the book, a real, an early copy. And she wrote and she said, this was really, at times, very hard for me to read. And I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. And thank you for helping me be more of a realist at the age of 90. And I feel like if she can get there, there's hope for all of us. Yes. I'll try, yeah. Um, did, did you you talked about either giving the beam back or paying for the beam? Has your family considered doing something like that for yes. the Lakota? Yes, yes. Thank you for asking. So I was really informed, as I think Judge Abbey knew I would, by the Jewish teachings about how to do repair. And, um, and that prompted me to have a lot of conversations with Lakota elders because Maimonides, a 16th century Jewish philosopher, he wrote out these steps of repentance. The first step is to stop doing the harm, which I think we can all acknowledge we haven't stopped doing to Native people in America. But the second is to say the truth out loud as most, as truthfully as you can. And in a lot of ways, this book is my effort to do that step. Um, one of the steps is to try and make it right based on what the people who have been harmed would want. And of course, I couldn't talk to every single Lakota citizen, but I did get the chance and the honor to interview a lot of Lakota elders, in particular the White Bull family. And it took, it was like maybe the second or third year that I had known Doug White Bull, and I had asked him this question before, but he finally reminded me, he's a, such a teacher, there's a Doug White Bull day in South Dakota because he's, he's such a beloved teacher, but. He, he didn't tell me what to do, but he reminded me of these native-led efforts to when private land comes up for sale in the Black Hills, it's being bought and then held in trust for all Lakota to use for ceremony. Because the United States, the Supreme Court ruled, oh, we actually did steal your land in the Black Hills. And for those of you who don't know, the Black Hills for the Lakota is as important as Israel is for many Jews. It's really where they feel like the center of their whole universe is and like so many of their origin stories are about wind cave which is now wind cave national park and this is all to say um they don't when the united states supreme court said well okay we'll give you the money because we stole it from you the lakota said we don't want your money these are the poorest among i did looked at the census data four of the 10 poorest places in America are on Lakota reservations. And they said, we don't want your money, we want the land. You don't sell your mother. Um, and so that money is just sitting in a bank, making more money for the United States as it sits there with interest. What my family did is 
there is an organization called the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, which has been around for 30 years. It's run by an Oglala Lakota guy. And they've been working for a really long time helping Native nations get their land back through private land sales or for people who, like my family, were homesteaders and have decided they want to return that land in some cases, or churches. You know, another amazing thing I learned is that churches got free land for the, um, the under grant. Grant said, I want you all to go out and convert Native people. And so uh, Vine Deloria Jr., the Lakota scholar, Dakota scholar said, uh, it was like there were franchises and different churches would be given a certain reservation to convert. And they were given free land for doing that. And many churches, although not all, are starting to give that land back. So my family has started a fund under the Indian Land Tenure Foundation called the Hay Sapa Land Recovery Fund. And um, many people in my family have donated to that fund and, and other people, readers have been sending in money. It's kind of amazing. And it's to buy, it's to help those efforts that are ongoing um, of buying up that land in the Black Hills. So that was the main thing I've done. Yeah. There were other things too, but that was the main thing. Yeah. Thanks for asking. And and I, I do want to say that, oh, and I'll say two more things about that. I've set our fundraising goal at $1.1 million, because that's the amount we got on the free land. And that I it's really a small part of the book because I didn't really want to center my family. There are a lot of efforts happening throughout the United States. We are living in a real vacuum of federal leadership on this effort. Um, unlike Canada or Australia or New Zealand, other countries with really complicated and upsetting histories of, of indigenous land taking and theft, we have not done anything close to the grappling those countries have done, albeit very imperfectly. Um, and so, but there are these efforts that are happening. There's a great podcast called Reconciliation Rising that are tracking these efforts of reconciliation between homesteader descendants and um, indigenous people. So they are happening. There's, yeah. Throughout. And there's a place in my book toward the back, and it's also freely available on my website um, that's called Resources for Further Research. Because this is a really personal story, but I think it's a really American story, and I think any of us living in America today who are not indigenous are benefiting from the taking of native land. And we all can find ourselves in this history. We can all find ourselves here. And so this is resources for how to learn your own proximity to this history in the way I have. Yes. I want to be as careful and thoughtful as I can with this question and really open it to any answer you want to give. But when you talk about complicated issues of indigenous land holding and theft, and your book came out in October, yes. I'm wondering if you get questions uh, about how this resonates in the current moment. Thank you. Yeah, my book came out October 3rd. So um, I do get questions, and I am glad to get them. Um, this was not meant to be a comparative history of Israel and America. Um, and yet, of course, there are rhymes and resonances with w what is heartbreakingly happening in the Middle East and what has happened here. I think it's, it's really not okay to say it's exactly the same because, of course, many, many Jews feel that they have a claim to indigeneity in Israel, and I don't think any non-indigenous person in America can has any ability to make a claim on that here at all. Uh, and yet, I do feel like when I listen to the language that is used by both Hamas and the IDF, describing the other side as savages, it just it hurts me inside, because that's exactly the language that the United States used to describe Native people here for a very long time, and it, and sort of de dehuman a, a key p way to dehumanize people and make it easier to kill them, and and to me, I know it's not so simple. It's definitely not simple, but there's so much binary out there in the way we're talking about Israel and and, and Gaza and Palestine, and I I don't know how we get towards, we don't build empathy with those binaries. To me, studying histories of oppression, studying each other's histories, mm 
it really has been a way for, for me to build compassion. I've seen it in myself and I've seen it in others. I think it's more important than ever. And I'll share a story with you I don't usually talk about, but I meant this book to be a corrective. And I, I also wanted to be really as nuanced and careful as possible. So I had Lakota readers and I had Jewish readers. Um, and then Penguin also hired like Jewish studies and an indigenous editor read them. But earlier, um, I, had, I did that myself. And, and, and a friend of mine who's a Jewish studies scholar, she said, um, I think you have a little internalized anti-Semitism. <laughs> and like I had worked so hard to do a corrective, I wasn't giving the same amount of compassion to my own people and my own family. And, and I then went and more deeply contextualized my own history by reading far more Jewish history and adding that into the book. And I felt more compassionate. It really was incredible to see that the thing I was hoping my book would do, once I did it myself, I saw that happen. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I know that we're getting there probably, but I don't know. Do we have time for one more? If anyone's got one more? Yes, in the back. Hello. Um, so I know your book like looked to undo like the wrongdoing in which your family said, in which you felt that your family had living on that land. Um, what responsibility, or if any, do you believe people have if they weren't involved within the oppression of those people? I love that question. Thank you so much for asking it. So there's, I'm gonna tell it a little bit of an around the way way. Um, there is this story in Deuteronomy in the Torah that describes the pre-Israelites and what they would do when they found a murdered body in the middle of the road. And they couldn't figure out who had done the murdering. And the communities that were nearby would measure their distance. And whichever community was closer to this corpse would not only take responsibility for burying the body, they would do a ritual that had real economic impact to them. It involved like killing a heifer and these other things. Um, because there was this sense that sin is social and sin pollutes the whole community. And I think it's very important that we each can measure our distance. So my distance to uh, the harm that was done to Native people and is being done as the descendant of homesteaders, my distance is so much closer. But historians, like Margaret Jacobs wrote this book called After 100 Winters, which is a really wonderful book. It was published recently with, from Princeton. And she just says it straight up. Anyone living in America today is benefiting from the taking of native land. So of course, if your family arrived here on slave ships, if you came to America last week or in the last few months, your distance is very different than mine but you still benefit. Breaking treaties are the, the underpinnings of most of our cities. Our highway systems are based on the taking and theft of native land. So many people, especially in the American West, we get our power from federal dam projects and many, many federal dam projects flooded native communities. I mean, the list really is ongoing. So does that answer your question? Yeah. I think there's ways for all of us to find ourselves in that his, in this history. I think that's it. I'm going to be signing books. Please come by and say hello if you have more questions. And thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad. <laughs>